So welcome to our adventurous October business meeting of the Hatfield School Committee. I'm Christy Boudreau. It is 718 and I'm calling us into session. Um, first item on our agenda is a new standing item that I really would like to do every month at our business meeting, which is short um, and it speaks to our mission. And so uh, it's not uncommon for mission driven organizations in their meetings to kick off with something that is sort of a short inspirational story or moment that anyone in the group can share that speaks to how they're seeing our mission come alive. So this is a chance if there's been like a really heartwarming story from the last month or something that you're excited to see or a way that our district goals are coming to life, it's a chance to share that publicly. So I open the floor for anyone who would like to share a mission moment and give it a try, see how it feels. Connor. Can I unmute now? Okay. Um, uh, so I, I, I'd just like to share Bradley homecoming. Uh, we had a, a, a robust turnout um, in the community and uh, a ton of kids come out uh, to and, and families and just community members to come out to the school and then for the parade and for the games out back. It was wonderful. It's great to see everyone. It felt like, a, you know, it felt it felt like it, it should feel, uh, which is is nice. So, and thank you to everyone here that I saw come out to. Anyone else have a mission moment? We're sort of catching up. Just like that. There we go. Um, you know, I think that as we talk about our district improvement plan, that we are all learners. And um, as part of our homecoming, we had Spirit Week and we had a, a day that was to recognize uh, very differently, the, the seniors, and some came dressed that many felt were offensive uh, because there were questions of ageism and ableism. And, um, and so we had to reflect on that really hard. I, I know I did. And um, there were some wonderful communications from citizens that were very thoughtful and encouraging and motivating. Um, and um, I think gratefully so we took down the pictures that uh, and, and the communications that were, were going back and forth. I, I'm not sure if it was Facebook or Instagram. Um, so we're all learners. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, we are really excited that we have publicly ask people to follow us on Instagram. I have Michael Wood and Ted Prasner who have shared the responsibility of posting things regularly and frequently. So we are really excited to put all the amazing learning that's happening out there to, to people. So reaching out to as many people as we can and getting as many followers. Ted is right there in front of <laughs> Sorry, you. your name is right there too. Sorry, Mike April. <laughs> Um, uh, the past week we have had, uh, our SRO in, uh, the building at HES and with officer Luna and officer Brindley, and those are our comfort dogs. And, um, it was Luna's birthday last week yeah. and she had a lay around her neck. And so that, that was a big conversation starter with all the kids. And, um, and then today I heard one of our kindergartners have more verbal output than I've ever heard him have while um, walking them down the hallway. So that was kind of, that was fun. So that's a cool thing that we have. We've got the dogs here, we've got the bunny, er, the dogs at, at both, but they've been at HES lately and then the bunnies here. So that's something cool that we have. <laughs> Glad to hear the dogs and bunnies are good together. Um, thank you guys for a nice, heartwarming kickoff with mission moment we'll try that again next month and committee members are also totally encouraged to have mission moments should you choose um and we're going to go to public comment and i do believe we have some with pu uh, public comment and given our slightly different forum i'm going to scoot out of the way so that they can present um 
also to so that anybody that's um watching us has a chance to hear as well so everyone has a, everyone has a camera everybody gets to be on. okay so are you sure you don't mind me inviting you really do not <laughs> okay um so uh my name is jen bogan for those of you i know some familiar faces of course um and i have a fifth grade student um at hatfield elementary school um my wife and son and I moved here about four years ago from Northampton, and um, there was a lot of conversation around that. And there was a lot of conversation around that because we knew we were intentionally moving into a community that was smaller, less diverse than the one we came from, and possibly had different um, political values or ideas amongst the general population. We loved Hatfield. We still love Hatfield. We live here. We're going to homecoming, we're going to events. Our son is thriving in the sports community and the community. Um, when we were gonna move here, people warned us. They frankly warned us. And I, I don't mean to um, criticize anyone by saying this, but you might've heard it's called hate field in some circles, okay? <laughs> so when we're choosing community to live in and to raise our son in and to give back to, hopefully, as we try uh, as much as we can, um, it was really important to us that we always felt accepted in Hatfield, and we have since the day we walked through the door. And that changed a little bit on October 5th. And that changed when I received and my wife received an email that contained information about CCD classes and Our Lady of Grace Church. I am certainly, certainly sure that everyone has the right to practice um, whatever religion, ethnicity, whatever uh, they choose to pr practice in their time, uh, in their private time, in their community, with their communities, their religious communities and their secular communities, right? What I don't understand is why we have a statute that we are following that is from the Supreme Court, absolutely, I've done my research, um, that allows non-school things to go out on our school listserv. So as a Jewish woman, as a lesbian, as a parent who believes that um, my child doesn't need to be saved, my child didn't go to confirmation in second grade, my child doesn't need any of these sort of things that were in this flyer, I was disturbed by this. And I felt like it was an unintentional, absolutely unintentional um, assault towards my family and the way I'm raising my child and the way and my wife feels very strongly the same way as well. So I'm here today to ask you all to consider looking at the statute that allows non-school things to go out because Superintendent Wood said, and I absolutely understand and agree, we can't discriminate. The way it is right now, we can't discriminate. And so Our Lady of Grace sends something out, a synagogue sends something out, a Islamic group sends something out. Um, you know, Just because those things doesn't, haven't happened doesn't mean they can't. And I'm concerned about that because I believe in the separation of church and state. And I believe that in a community that may or may not be primarily Christian or Catholic faith should be open to families like mine. And we celebrate those differences and we appreciate each other and we don't unintentionally, um, you know, sort of put it in someone's face that um, they're not part of the community, the, the sort of, underlying um, religious community that's part of the school. So that's why I'm here today. I just wanna start a conversation. I just feel like um, it was really upsetting to us. I know that Superintendent Wood said this has gone out before or something of this, to this effect had gone out before. I've certainly never received it. It might be because it was before COVID and it was a paper thing and I lost it, I don't know. No matter what, I don't want my kids backpack to say you need to be saved in second grade. And that's the way we felt about it. And that's the way we read it. Um, so thank you guys for your time and all of your efforts. I'm happy to answer any questions or engage in the conversation. I know, I don't know actually what the yeah. process is. So public comment, we are happy to hear you out. It's okay. not something we discuss in the meeting. Okay. Unless it was already on the agenda. Right. It is not on the it agenda as far as I know. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Okay. okay. I will 
take a look. See, I don't see any other guests with us in person or online. And so that will close public comment. Um, is there anyone who needed to pull something off of the consent agenda? Seeing none, uh, we will uh, approve the consent agenda and move on. Um, seeing no student report for this evening, we'll move on to administration reports. Mr. Wood. Yes. There we go. All right. Now I've lost my report. So just taking a look at a few things, highlights. Um, we are continuing in our administrative meetings to take a look at instructional leadership. Our, our big focus um, is to look at our assessment plan that we're trying to develop that's gonna be K through 12. Embedded in that is how are them we going to use that uh, to inform instruction, um, and we're looking at our MTSS model, our, our support model for students across uh, areas, uh, disciplines, and um, so that's something that I feel very strongly that we need to have to really drive uh, transparency about our work with kids um, and to help inform our, our professional development that uh, we plan throughout the year. Um, we are exploring a grant deadlines fast approaching us, but there is a grant uh, that could help us with curriculum materials. As I read it, I think we can get some materials that we already purchased. We can get reimbursed for them, um, but we'll take a look at that. Uh, but uh, so we'll, we're going to work on that this week and try to uh, apply for that grant. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a limit on, on the amount like this, that it's capped at, um, but I'm sure that um, they're, they're, I'm sure there is a limit and that, uh, that, that they will look at whatever we propose and then make decisions based on what funds they have. That's through DESE. So I spent a good portion of last week uh, on, on uh, the roof issues at HES. Uh, I do have a vendor. Um, I invited three in, uh, two showed up. Um, I do have a vendor that I'm going to move forward with to do a repair. Um, I am concerned uh, with con the continued leaking. Um, originally, they uh, proposed something that would be, they gave a, a, a back of the envelope estimate of $8,000, but they actually made a proposal that was uh, roughly $5,700. Um, and embedded in that is trying to identify a little better what the source of the leaks are. Um, both uh, parties that came and looked at the roof, the other party, had been up on the roof last year. Uh, but both that came this year did say that the roof is in rough shape, uh, not only in the area that we're talking about for the leaks, but in other areas as well, um, that the type of product that was used in, in the construction of the roof uh, is something that is no longer used in the industry. And um, it, it's a very thin product and rips very easily. And while the rips themselves aren't necessarily the problem, it's where how it's uh, used the adhesive is to the roof. So if it's ripped and the adhesive is gone or, or uh, small amounts are there, then the leak begins and it travels. So this is a really an issue of find the traveling uh, leak uh, because it's not like easily like right above where the water is coming down. Uh, that that much we seem to we seem to know. Um, the DPW. Um, is continuing to work on our path here. We are making some headway. There's some progress uh, being done this past week. We've had several loads uh, delivered and they're working on that. We'll be applying for our third leg because we actually think we, we're gonna finish phase one and phase two with what we have um, with the billing that's been come forward so far. And um, so we'll go with phase three, which is sort of the circle back around uh, to the front uh, piece of the, of the yard. Uh, and um, so hopefully we'll, we'll get those funds from the CPA again this year. Um, we are, as part of our security upgrades, we are doing some phone work here. So uh, over the Columbus Day weekend, we had um, some electrical ports added 
uh, where none existed. Uh, and so that work was done and now we're going to have the phone company come in. I think we've finalized um, November 7th, uh, 8th, uh, that they'll be coming in after hours um, so that they can um, start that work and they'll do it over two days. Um, we're also looking at trying to upgrade our video uh, cameras that are both inside the school and outside of the school. Um, we don't have full 360 view of the building here. Uh, and similarly at um, HES. Uh, and so we're looking at how to do that. In conjunction with that, we would like to upgrade our ability to buzz people in to make it more flexible for our staff. Right now, um, at both buildings, people have to get up and buzz people in. In most settings that I've worked in, they have something either available on their desk uh, to, to just buzz people in, or really today there's availability of an app, there's an app for that, um, and they can uh, buzz people from their phones wherever they are in the building with, with video ability so they see who's there at the door. Um, so we're looking to, to upgrade that to, to uh, both uh, make it more meaningful and um, I think really safer for our employees to have to, so they don't have to keep getting up and, and down. Uh, and um, I mentioned the senior citizen piece um, that day. The homecoming was wonderful. It was a beautiful day. Uh, our teams did uh, remarkably well. Uh, and so I'm really pleased uh, that, that, that it was so well attended. I, hear, I heard a number of people say it was probably one of the best attended. I thought last year was well attended, but actually some citizens thought it was very well attended as well. So, um, and, uh, you know, just in, in general, I've been getting into classrooms. Um, uh, a lot to uh, just see what's going on in the classrooms. Um, what I really appreciate in, in both buildings and, and really at all ages K through 12 is really the amount of interaction between kids and among kids um, around curriculum uh, and the work that they're doing in pairs and triads uh, as opposed to a uh, teacher and the stage, uh, stage on the stage model. Uh, and so, you know, that dialogue learning ultimately is a social task. Uh, and so kids have to talk about what they're learning. And um, I was actually in uh, Ms. Gaia's class, uh, Mrs. Gaia's class the other day. And, uh, you know, that's what the task was. They had to explain how they got their answer. And it was really interesting how some of the kids had a really hard time to do it. Uh, and they really were struggling with finding the words to explain what they did, because they had to think about what they did first. And that, and that was task number one before they actually interact with their peer. Um, so it, it, I think, you know, we're on the right track uh, in terms of getting kids to talk about what they're learning. That's my report for the day. Personnel, uh, we have one driver uh, that, uh, we have a van driver that uh, submitted their resignation. They'll be leaving actually officially at the end of the month. Um, we have posted, uh, we have not been able to find anyone for that. This is uh, very difficult. Um, we are canvassing, we've asked, we've asked our bus company, we say, you know, we have the drive, we have the van, you have a driver, you know, in terms of just trying to get more hours for people and so forth. We've been, I think um, Molly has been very creative in, in her approach. Um, so it's, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, we're not the only ones. Uh, and so we have not been able to fill it. So that's our only vacancy. Um, at the moment, uh, and the um, we have not had any changes in enrollment, so we are doing well um, in that regard. Nobody's left, nobody's come. So our October enrollment uh, will be completed and submitted. The solar piece, uh, we're working on that. Um, it's very challenging to um, to you know, get the actual information that we're looking for here. Um, the, the bottom line is, I apologize, I did have a spreadsheet. I didn't attach that there. Um, I will attach a spreadsheet uh, for you. Uh, the, 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 the good news is there is an overall credit of a bit, about uh, just shy of uh, $12,000. It's 11,000 and something. The, the challenge is that um, uh, Eversource has not been able to talk to us about why we have such a large credit. We think it does have something to do with the, 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 the sellback um, to the solar, but it's not detailed on the bill. And 
the timing of it is a little odd for it to have been that. But so we need them to talk, come in and talk with us and they won't do that. And they, uh, Riley's not been able to get a, a phone conversation with them to go over that. Um, but, but solar's installed and running. And solar is installed, it's running. Events. Um, and um, we're, we haven't saved anything in terms of kilowatt usage. I mean, that seems to be about the same as I look back, uh, I have a one year comparison, um, but, um, and I think we could do more there to save on, on, on energy in terms of, you know, what's, what's on. I know when I leave at four o'clock or so, I'm going around shutting off lights before our, our night custodian gets here at six, um, just so that we have that short time of, of saving uh, some electricity. Um, and uh, so, it, so we need really Eversource to come forward and talk to us more about how, how the billing works. The, the dates don't line up well. Thank you. Uh, before we leave, Mr. Wood, are there questions on the superintendent's report? I have two. Um, Regarding the van driver, mm -hmm. would it be possible to check with like the Council of Aging and see if their Good drivers idea. want to mm -hmm. pick up a few more yep. hours? That's a great idea. That I've reached out to a number of the school districts, <laughs> but I hadn't thought about that. I could even look at other towns. Yeah. Well, let's ask our, well, our Council first. of Aging yeah. first. Definitely. I was just with others. Jerry today, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. They do have to have a 7D license, and I'm, but I'm, and I'm not sure if they do or not, but I think they might. They might. Okay. Um, and regarding the solar, I know for my situation, Eversource won't answer any questions about it. It's whoever we have solar through, our solar company, that will answer all your questions okay. about how that breaks down in and how the credits work. All right, so I'll reach back uh, Rather than chasing Eversource, mm -hmm. try the solar company. Great idea. Great idea. Um, with, the, with the path, um, and I was able to, to go and see it at home, is there a plan to do some type of stone or pave or do something over it? Yeah, it's supposed to be some stone dust that goes on the top of it. Um, and we were talking about edging to really kind of contain it that we need to add um, so that it looks like a path rather than somebody just developed a road. Um, so there's there's more finish work that needs to be done. There's, they're really in the process of just getting the path, path in there. And and do we anticipate, I was, I was when I was looking at it, um, I was worried about the timeline and then it like actually like washing out mm -hmm. is so is that dusting and that is that anticipated that it would be done soon or well we're kind of at the at the whim of the dpw in terms of because it's not like a dedicated time for them they're, they're kind of fitting us in around the other projects that they have going uh the, that's the volunteer part of our project uh okay. in terms of because we're not paying for that. Um, and so, um, you know, originally we had hoped that it would be in um, and completed to the second phase. Um, and then the spring, they would probably do the finish, finish work. Um, so it would be after um, the rainy season. Uh, so, because I think very shortly it's going to be frozen. It actually goes back to what we talked about a month ago about um, memorial stone for tweeters. And that might tie in very nicely with this path. So if we can find some entity that wants to take on. That would be great. I mean, uh, looking at it, it, it would take an awful lot of papers, uh, but over time, that would be wonderful. Maybe not paving the actual walk that you walk on, yep. just maybe the edging or, mm -hmm. I don't know. No, I agree. It's, it's an option to think about for the future that yep. we can get some of these things that are doing the papers that would help. 
that we can it, it would take Dr. Driscoll, would you like to share your report? There we go. Um, sure. So um, <clears throat> I mentioned homecoming before. It was it was uh, well attended. It was a great event. Um, a lot of support from the community for our for our students and, and our alumni. Um, it was great to have. We had uh, we had a uh, the, the national anthem all queued up on a phone to play an instrumental. But we realized that one of our um, our uh, alum was in attendance who sang who's got a brilliant voice and, and was able to sing it for us live so that was great to have uh she was a, a recent graduate last year um one thing i didn't mention was uh diana zinal who is this year's uh, uh recipient of the um homecoming award from smith academy uh she received that for outstanding dedication and service to smith academy with work on the boosters over the past several years um so so congratulations and thanks to her for all of our support over the years. Um, uh, next, I'd like to go into some, you know, I, I really kind of focus this update on some of the, um, some of the, the, uh, the professional learning that's going on in, in the evaluation system. Uh, those kind of things work, work together this year. Um, <clears throat> so very shortly, educators are submitting their educator plans, which consist of two goals, a student learning goal, as well as a professional practice goal. Um, this year, our, our school's professional practice focus um, has kind of narrowed it in on uh, collaborative learning, which um, uh, Superintendent Wood spoke to, to briefly in terms of the, the, what, what it kind of can look like in the classroom. Um, that, that's been a progression from years past. Uh, in the, the past few years, they had done some work on project-based learning, which is um, kind of more, more uh, overarching in its scope. You know, you, you have a a project that can kind of guide uh, across several disciplines through questions, you know, how, how it looks in different ways. Um, and that, that a shift towards project-based learning is a, a real kind of sea change. It's, a, it's not just a, a shift in kind of like what's done necessarily in one class or another. It's a, it's a shift in educational philosophy as a whole, if you really, if you really go, um, go that route. And so we, we, we sort of distilled down, okay, what you know, if the, the work that we've been doing and that, what, what is the most impactful work that we've been doing and what is, you know, what does the, the literature and the research say about that? Um, and, and a big piece that is, is cross-discipline, it's not just, you know, in reading or in math or in science or in the arts, um, it is this idea of collaborative learning. Uh, and so learning that really embraces two, two big key components um, to, to be done well. It's more than just you know, sitting together, or more than just working working in groups with each other, um, it's learning experiences that, as they're as they're developed by teachers, they they have two uh, really kind of key parts. Well, they have more than two, but the two big ones are what are called positive interdependence. So, where students rely on each other for parts of their learning. So it's not just uh, as, as Superintendent Wood said, the stage on the stage, or relying on the teacher to deliver information. Um, but but relying on you know if, if I was paired up with um, Principal Petra to you know to I, I would need something that she was doing or creating in order to do my part of that um, and so there's there the collaboration is not just I got this answer what do you get oh I got this answer it's okay you got this answer I need that piece so I can I can finish this uh, finish this this learning activity that we're doing um, and, and the other piece is is individual accountability because. I think we can all kind of remember back to um, group projects when when we were when we were in school where one person would do the whole project and for the whole group or uh, that and, and so that that's the other key piece is when when folks are developing those lessons okay how how am i going to rely on you and you're going to rely on me and how is every person in a group or in a in a cluster going to be held accountable for their their learning um the nice thing about that is that it can be kind of tailored into any class uh, in any subject so that you know it's not you know as an art teacher could do it one way PE teacher could do it another way math teacher could do it another way English teacher could do it another way um, and it can and can be very kind of I won't say easily but it can be tailored to uh, units that are that are already created uh, in adapting learning experiences to, to reflect those things um, so an example would be kind of you know if you're in a say you're in a math class and the you're learning about area and um, you have maybe there's a project where you're using the the area formulas to 
decide how much it would cost to paint a wall. So this, we're in the library. Our wall dimensions are this, this, and this. Um, and you have have students working together. One person might be, you know, the the, the responsible for pricing it out based on the dimensions that the group, the uh, another student had had uh, measured. Um, and so they they could work together on that. So they both have to apply that formula for area in different ways to to figure out how much how much it would cost. Um, so not not a, I mean not a full project in terms of project based learning where they're not actually going to paint all the walls, but um, you know using similar similar ideas of okay we're we're working together to accomplish a specific goal that the the the, the real the real meat of it is that it applies the learning. So it applies what they've done and it applies where they've, you know, the information that they've not just had given to them, but that they've, they've learned and, and um, are able to show that. So that's a very long winded explanation of um, <clears throat> our focus, our, our professional practice focus as, as a staff this year has been on uh, pro, um, collaborative learning. And so that's that's kind of kind of weave through the year. We'll spend time um, during both our, our staff meeting, what is called PLC time, which is a professional learning community where we, we work in groups to see how things are going, uh, what we need, what next steps are 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 going to happen, and, and kind of um, in action steps on those. And then uh, also our, our uh, PD throughout the year will will be largely reflected on on that uh, and working working collaboratively with each other because that's what we're working on um, to to develop um, and refine plans for for student learning throughout the year. Um, and that really it does mesh well with the, the research about what strong learning looks like. So it's, you know, it's applied learning, it's learning where they rely where students rely on each other. Um, and, and there's still a high level of accountability for for individual students. Um, it, it, part of that an offshoot of that has been the middle school team, which I, I, I wrote about in the update here. Um, and this really came, you know, uh, part of their focus, it really came from some of the, the project based learning that they'd been been doing. Um, a big question that they had was, okay, we've been doing some of this, this more applied learning, um, you know, really kind of innovative uh, project design, really kind of unique work that the students have been doing, but we're relying on a grading model that that is existed for ever. Um, you know, how, how do we how do we grade this assignment on a you know A through F scale? Um, and they've looked at, at more what's called competency-based learning mod, uh, grading models, which rather than rather than saying you know A through A through F, it would be okay. Here's here was the goal of the project. Here's the it, it, you know you've seen rubrics for writing frequently. You'll have that. So this would be rubrics not just for writing but but for for most assignments. So rather than having um, you know, rather than having an you know an A through F at the end of end of an assignment, they would have a rubric that says, okay, this is you know the, what is this learning, you know where here are the the three goals for learning and where where does this assignment fall? Um, practically speaking, they're you know they're still they're then taking that work and then assigning a letter grade to it, so it's it doesn't look different. So at the end of the day, the students will still have a have a letter grade, a traditional grade. So so. Uh, the them and, and parents will know. Okay, this was a you know this was 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 representative of a B, um, but this gives them more information about what went into that. So it's not it's not as as mysterious as okay where did this where this B come from? Um, and there's still you know more more traditional assignments that are that are embedded as well. Um, one really neat thing that I've seen from that has been the ownership that students will will take in their assignments. Um, I was in a class the other day where they, they do a self assessment. So they take the they take, you know, what what the assignment was supposed to be graded on, they grade themselves on it first. And frequently, most of the time, it lines up, they're really honest, it lines up right with with where the where the teacher would would, would place them. Um, and and the, an interesting trend was that oftentimes, uh, it, well, it, let me backtrack a little bit. And if there's a discrepancy, there'll be a, a, a meeting between a conference between the teacher and the student to talk about what the discrepancy is and 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 look at where you know where where the work is actually represented in, in the rubric. Um, frequently, students will be more critical of themselves in their work 
um, than, than the teachers would have. And they'll have to have a meeting to say, well, you know, you're, you're pretty harsh on yourself in this particular category. Let's, let's really look at your assignment here and what you, what you showed. You showed this work. Do you, you know, we're, and, and it's led to some really, really great conversations. Um, and, and the vast majority have, of students, because one of the things I'll, I'll you know, when I, I, it might be a little disruptive, but when I, when I go into classes to observe, I'll, I'll usually talk to the, talk to the students about what they're doing, what they're learning, uh, how they're, you know, how they're, they're feeling about things. Um, and overwhelmingly, they have felt that that, that, um, that piece of, of being able to have those conferences and being able to, to look at their own learning has been, been a very positive shift. Um, and and that's, that's coming right from them, which has been great. Um, briefly, uh, we, we've had, we had a, 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 something we add this year was a, a, an academic support center, which is, uses uh, peer tutors so students can self-select um, if they, you know, they have a big project coming up uh, or if they, you know, they're, they're not doing so hot in a class and they want to get a little extra help, they can self-select to go to that. Um, and that's been, uh, we've been utilizing that more, I think, uh, recently as we're heading towards the end of the first quarter where, where people are realizing it's crunch time. Um, they're saying, okay, uh, I, or being encouraged by, by their teachers to, to sign up for that. Um, and the last uh, piece that I wrote about was we're hoping to run an eighth grade DC trip again this year. We've received one of three quotes. Uh, the second one should be coming anytime in the last couple of days. Um, so we're, we'll, we'll reach out about that as well. Um, and we'll get three quotes to you know, decide where our vendor will be for that. I really appreciate that the in-depth explanation of some of that. So it really helps bring alive that report for us. Are there questions? I just so are we so are we moving forward? Moving are forward, are we using both the project-based learning and the collaborative learning models? Or is or is the collaborative learning approach replacing it, the project -based so the, the collaborative approach is the focus on not just not just individual projects but kind of the focus of the year so the the way it looks for most teachers is you know during every unit x number of you know have x number of collaborative learning experiences embedded um, and so that's it's more kind of wide widespread um, the the units that have been created for project based based learning they already include the, that collaborative learning piece. That's a key part of, of project-based learning. So there are projects that have been created over the last several years that have gone really well that, that teachers are continuing to use. Um, and, and they're continuing if they, if they would like to, to develop those. Um, but it's not, you know, the, the, those are, 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 are pretty, not narrow in scope might not be the right word, but it's not, not as widespread. You know, it was, you know, they're, um, you, you may have, you know, a project, you know, a, a project-based learning project, which is a pretty, pretty big undertaking. You might have one of those a year, um, but the the collaborative learning piece was an effort to take what was was most impactful from those and and spread it out as wide as we could um, over over the course of the year. Yeah. Anyone else have Muted. questions or, or thoughts they want to? I, I have to say it's it's really interesting to think about this in concert with the district improvement plan work and how they will dovetail the idea of building community is so necessary for that to work well because that's at the core of all of that learning. So it's really interesting. Thank you. Principal Petra. Hello. All right. Um, we have done a lot of data that are conducted a lot of uh, assessments this fall on students. So we have been, my report is mostly focused on what we've been doing with that data. Um, first and foremost, we have contracted with the University of Hartford. Um, I brought in this consultant I'd used in my previous district. Um, part of that is to really get all of the teachers in grades K to six utilizing a, this, the same template for small group instruction. 
Um, it is quite prescribed, but I feel it is going to really move students because the most powerful piece of that is the discussion part, or actually, I'm sorry, what the kids are reading because the teacher is actually listening and coaching kids as they're reading. Um, so it's a powerful tool and we had the state in my building for a few, actually nine years, and we were able to get the state out of the building with utilizing this particular protocol. So it was a small tweak. Um, there were some inconsistencies when I had first started um, back in March and I was just kind of like going in rooms and just kind of checking, seeing how things were going that I felt this small tweak would really kind of move our students. You know, when we think about gaps and about COVID happening, this small thing I think is really gonna be what moves our students um, forward. Um, so based on that, we also had data meetings. So those data meetings, we're looking at both the DRA, the iReady, because basically our teachers are grouping students in small group based on the DRA, the developmental reading assessment, which basically levels them. And we have like grouped students together so that they're having that same instructional zone of proximal development instruction. They're using that guided reading protocol and then that word work piece of the protocol, because the last few minutes of each protocol is devoted to, at least in the earlier grades, to word work that dibbles data where the nonsense word fluency, short vowel work, the teacher can then be a little bit more targeted in some of that word work, again, to build on the phonics to help students with their reading. So of those data meetings consisted of not only the two classroom teachers from each grade, but also our reading interventionists, both of them, the EL teacher when that student was in that particular grade and we were working with that grade, as well as our special education teacher. So we had everybody sitting around the table together, basically confirming, are these groups working? Are these the kids that have to be in this group together? And then we were also identifying students who, who might need remediation or intervention and those letters went out. So that our reading interventionists are working with students who need a little extra support. So we're excited to see. We were doing this for um, our next data meeting should be, we do benchmarking in the winter. So we have a, a six to eight week course to be looking at utilizing these current uh, intervention groups. And then we will come back in six to eight weeks to benchmark again and see if any of those students have progressed. If they're progressing, we either keep on the same course of action or we might have to have different court conversations about what needs to change and teachers know that they can move students in groups depending upon how well and how quickly they're moving. So I have given them a directive, they do not need to wait. Um, if they notice that a student is where you're, is moving and progressing the way they need to, they can change groups with them at any time. We've even got um, one grade where we've actually cross graded a student. We have a student in a lower grade who is reading in such a place that we have them working in a different grade because there was a group there. He didn't have a group in his classroom. So we're utilizing our teachers to in fact, most of our teachers or almost all of them actually are cross grading or within the grade, looking at groups of students together. So some students in Connor's class might be, two kids might be in his classroom coming into mine to do a reading group with some of my students. So we're utilizing all people using that process. Questions? So how do parents find out how their kids are doing? So obviously you've sent letters home if you wanna do intervention. Students that aren't doing, getting an interventional support, how do families know what's going on? I guess they probably won't until conference time. I mean, at this point, teachers are reading with students. We are definitely moving in, progressing them through the, the levels that they need to be by the time they end their, their grade level, because there's a, each, and I can't say it, it's, different for each grade level. So they come in at a certain DRA level, they need to go and depending upon the grade, it's many different levels, um, especially in the younger grades. Um, so at this point, it's just working on small group instruction and whole class instruction. So I guess if that's, if no one's heard anything, then things are going well. Anybody? Okay, thank you. Dr. Bremner. Almost Dr. Bremner, almost. So when are you officially Dr. Bremner? In December. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, student services, uh, we've uh, been keeping busy, but I have a short update. Um, we have uh, contracted uh, to fill our BCBA position for the remainder of the year. Um, I was able to uh, connect with a staff member who uh, during last year and at the beginning of this year, um, 
uh, had been contracted during several leaves. So it's a familiar person. They already know our kids and our staff. So I'm really excited to have Greg Nephews on board. Um, and then um, our new speech and language pathologist will be starting on Monday. Um, and so I, again, for the second or third time, uh, lots of kudos to Lori Kratzner for um, all of her help uh, as our SLPA and, um, and, and honestly to, to Kate as well, who's, who'd been contracted back to take care of some things for us. Um, we have, in addition to the driver, we uh, have posted for a maternity leave um, in, uh, at the elementary school in our department. Um, so uh, we are actively uh, seeking candidates for that position and it's been posted on a number of platforms. Um, uh, for data and accountability, uh, we had, when the state came for our tiered focus monitoring on site last year and they reviewed files, there was one item uh, and it ended up related to an, a, something that a different district had written, but um, one item needed to be uh, redrafted immediately. We did that this summer and past that, that's checked off now. Um, and then we had our two items for the continuous improvement monitoring we had gone through. Um, and we completed the first, the, the first set of due dates was September 30th and uh, passed all that in, all that looked good. So we're all on track in that way. Um, professional development, uh, continuing, uh, I've done a lot of work this, this month, particularly um, with the pyramid model with our preschool team um, that is in a simple way, MTSS for preschool. Um, and so we have uh, Marlene Robbins who comes out and that's grant funded um, through the Pyramid Consortium, through the feds, through the state, they, they have their own grant. It's not a grant we have, they're, they're grant funded themselves. Um, so she uh, joins us for PD and provides high quality PD for our staff and she'll be coming out on site on the 8th. I confirmed that uh, today. Um, and then uh, the team here at SA, we've been um, exploring some executive functioning curriculum. We have our skills class where we do provide targeted instruction in executive functioning, um, but with uh, wanting to have more of a set curriculum that's research-based with some fidelity. So we've um, been vetting out different things. Uh, we've made some purchases of some texts, but um, are looking at some digital platforms and had a, a lovely PD last week with um, a company, a, a PD slash sales call and are getting some additional um, free um, PD with them this Friday. Um, so that's exciting to, to boost up our executive functioning portion of our skills class. Um, and then uh, I've been able to support staff and leaders in both buildings um, with the building support team process. So functionally that is um, the building based process, but um, uh, it, we are required to have a pre-referral process towards special education. So that serves as that as well. So we've made sure that all of the systems flow and um, I provided training to the whole district on a flow chart that we developed in the spring last year. And then um, both buildings, op they do the BST very differently for obvious reasons, because the needs are quite different, um, but both systems are up and going and finding solutions for kids, which is helpful. Any questions? Thank you very much. So, with that, um, that'll close out our updates and we'll move on. Well, actually, still an update. Budget subcommittee update. Mr. Sullivan. Okay. Um, so uh, at the last budget subcommittee meeting, we discussed um, a number of things that Mr. Wood actually already covered, but uh, we talked about the roof. Um, at the time, he had the estimate of about $8,000 to do the repair at HES. And you mentioned you got a better number there. Um, we talked a lot about utility costs, uh, um, not just the solar issues, but uh, or, you know that we're saving money with the solar, but that the supply rate has gone up about 50%, um, which is an unaffected cost that all schools are going to be dealing with 
um, and how do we go ahead planning for that in the future. Also, we're looking at increased costs for trash pickup going up, so things that will be an issue as we develop our budget. Um, uh, Mr. Wood did let us know that the town received a larger nursing grant this year. Last year, um, in 21-22, it was about $14,000 for um, coverage of uh, nursing fee, uh, nurse supplies, um, anything in the nurse's office. This year, we got up to about $30,000. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and then um, we are planning on starting on our work on next year's budget earlier than normal. We're going to start that, um, get the ball rolling at our next meeting so that we have all of our ducks in a row, hopefully. Any questions from the committee? Yes, Ms. Hitch. Um, is the nursing grant specific to supplies or? Can it be used for personnel? Like, are there any details? I believe it was covered for both, right? Yeah, it's it's wide ranging. It really is, including mental health. Too. So uh, I just met with the nurse unit, and we're going to take a look at mental health. Uh, trying to talk uh, buttress our connection with um, our agencies, uh, with parents and families uh, connected to agencies. Uh, Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to move on to our first vote of the night. And this has to do with um, CES and their capital reserve fund. And this is something we are required to vote on. And Kathy is going to help make that make more sense to us with a quick update, because I'm sure you read it along in your packet. But Kathy can explain better. I don't, I don't know that I can explain it better. Um, but there was a piece in your pack that explained it well. Um, the collaborative was founded by school districts in Hampshire County, and their articles of agreement have very strict instructions about how things happen budgetarily and with finances. So the collaborative would like to create a capital reserve account. Um, and to do so, they need specific approval from each member district. They have to have two thirds of the member district approve this. So that is why this is a separate vote. It wasn't in the consent agenda. They have to clearly know what we're going on and understand that we're getting the collaborative permission to open up this reserve account. It costs each district nothing. So I'm going to just ask publicly one of the questions I asked, which I think is really clear, but just in case, is there any downside to us supporting this vote? None at all. No. Okay. So there's no additional cost coming from any district. No. It's basically they get to set up a different bank account. Yes. Okay. And they just need permission from all the districts that are members. It, is there anyone, uh, Ms. Bremner? Um, all the district members. Though there won't be any additional cost, will there be any change in services that we pay for? No, no. It's, nothing is tied to this. This is just. This is just. They had funds. They had funds that they that they could shift and wanted to and wanted create, to create accounts, accounts to have to support to support capital planning projects. Capital. Planning. They want to do some renovation work, and by earmarking money into this account. Work is and by the cleanest this financial, financial way to go about it. cleanest financial way to go about it. And then anytime they're talking, talking about moving money, changing accounts, that has to be approved by the district. Okay. 
with that explanation, is there a motion on the floor supporting or refusing to support the creation of CES's capital reserve I think fund? There's um, suggested language. Suggested sure. language. So, um, yeah. It, hmm. Sure. All right. Uh, I, I mute. Okay, I will move to approve the creation of the Collaborative for Educational Services Capital Reserve Account with a balance limit of $5 million for the purpose of accumulating funds for the acquisition, maintenance, and improvement of capital items. Is there a second? Uh, let's take a voice call, like go around just to make sure we have clear accounting. Um, Adam, would you like to kick us off? Aye. Bench, aye. Boudreaux, aye. Englehart, aye. Okay, so very clearly we have a five supporting votes, no non supporting or abstaining votes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I will fill out the paperwork and hand it over. Moving on to the preschool policy um, for our third reading and a vote for the preschool policy. And I, Ms. Binch, thank you very much. And I will. Okay, the school committee has been given um, the third edition of our proposed preschool policy. Um, the updates that we made were not substantive to the content, um, mostly involved um, reformatting some more of the tables to clarify the uh, priority of admissions. We also rearranged some of the items at the end of the policy to be more clear about the lottery process. Um, and we separated out the long section about considerations for families with multiples. Do you have anything to add, Ms. Englehart? Okay. So I think we're, that's all I have to present about it. Okay. Is there a motion? Anyone uh, would like to make a motion to put this up for a vote? I'll make a motion to accept the preschool policy um, as written. I'll second. Two late seconds. Always so exciting. Okay. Um, before we vote, is there any further discussion on policy IHBBA? I'm just curious if you guys received any public input on it at all. That's my question as well. I did not receive any additional public input since. I have had input early on and it was somewhat split, um, but probably in the head count leaned to where we landed with the three-year-olds. I was asked, but not given any input. Just wanted to know. I would like to very publicly and very deeply thank the policy team for really digging in on this one because it's so much clearer. Um, and so it, it feels like a nice combination of there was really um, good evidence-based um, policy change that came in, um, but particularly just clarity, which I think the previous policy didn't offer. And uh, so I think that will serve the district well. Any other? Okay. Are we ready for a vote? All in favor of approving pol preschool policy IHBBA? Sullivan, aye. Aye. And aye. Boudreaux, aye. Okay, so moved. I think we can do it with the voice, voice, voice vote, but that's okay. Never hurts. So, yay for any policy. And 
that wraps that up. And so we're moving on to our district improvement plan. And so I just wanna clarify what our goal is tonight for the district improvement plan, which we've been working on very diligently. Um, does anybody need a printout? Everybody have one? So um, thank you, administration. Thank you, Ms. Engelhart, uh, for working on getting some of the notes that we had from last week um, into the plan. I, I thought it would be important for us to share this more publicly tonight. I'm gonna to see if I can actually put it on the screen, which, you know, bear with me. And, and that way we're sharing this publicly, um, but not taking a vote on this tonight. So here we go. Um, and so for those who might be interested in following along on this, I guess to recap, the district improvement plan is a three-year strategic plan. Um, we have um, gone through an iterative process to really look strategically at what the district needs and to then come back together and prioritize that. And we have boiled that down to three primary goals um, with multiple strategies in each. The first goal, um, in the plan as it is in our draft, doesn't necessarily mean it's our first goal, we're not trying to prioritize these tonight, um, is to grow enrollment. The second is um, to nurture an invested community. And the third, which, and this is the one where we haven't had as much review on, um, we can come back and speak to a little bit more tonight, is um, reaching and achieving academic, social, and emotional potential. And so that's the piece where we sort of left off and administration has come back and honed some of that. Um, we also have come in and Kathy and I sat down and worked last week to take the direction that we all um, talked about in the workshop to restructure all of that as best we could to incorporate the tactics that people had brought forward. So for the most part, we have captured that, that we had all looked at. Um, and then we did our best taking a first draft at implementation dates by tactic. So the dates don't line up with the overarching goal because that's a three-year goal that we're gonna, there's lots of moving pieces, but the idea being that the district would have accountability dates tied to the tactical. So specific tasks, some of which, felt very ongoing, some of which felt like, nope, we need to put a date that we say, yep, we have checked this box. Um, and that we looked at those and tried to frame out the flow of this so that you can um, kind of have a chronological feel. Um, and forgive the code of many colors approach to this, but we were looking for ways to make sure that is that went from page to page that you could kind of see um, what strategies, what the tactics lined up to be for each one. So scrolling through this for the benefit of anyone who wants to um, move along, we still need a little bit of work. Um, in particular, I've highlighted some places in the objectives, which are our measurable accountabilities um, that would be sort of what we keep watch over for three years, where we need a little bit of research still um, to make sure that we're we're finding the right place to be accountable so that it's I personally don't want us to put a goal down there that is already achieved and doesn't really have any meaning because it's like a, a gimme um, and I, I really don't want to put goals out there that we could not possibly attain either and so it just means that we need to do a little homework to make sure that we've got those listed So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, I would like for us to have this ready to vote on at our next business meeting. Um, and I think the alignment is pretty close. I do think there's some areas that we probably still need to address. So I'd like to open the floor just for a conversation tonight. Um, about 
things that you guys have seen that you want to make sure that we address before it comes back to a vote. So. Um, I would like to see, um, I think one of the, the biggest areas of continued edit is on page five, um, with, uh, deliver meaningful continuous professional development and kind of decide, um, like in here, it says move to goal three. So see if we are, if that, um, if that strategy as well as those tactics is going to move um, is going to move into reach and achieve academic social and emotional potential I still think that there's a um, I still think that there is a need to speak to academic achievement and um, you know and our plan to make sure that we get our students there do you see the PD strategy moving lock, stock, and barrel onto um, the so third goal? Third goal. Is, that what you, is that what you would like to see it do? Um, um, or is there a different approach to it? And I'm, I'm totally open, Jen. I just right. want to. Right. I think it's fine if it's included in. The I third think it's goal. fine I mean, I if it's included um, in in the third goal. I mean, I, I don't. Um, you know, it fits in there. You know, it fits in there with a line and in, in deliver um, curriculum. Um, I, I think it makes that. I, I think, I think it, it makes, makes that. Goal, that um, I think it makes that large, goal. Um, but I would be happy to see it be a standalone or to. Um, um, but I would goal, be happy to see it be a standalone or to the, um, that, fall under that, that strategy goal. and but those the, tactics. What would be important all. to me is that the, mm -hmm. that that strategy and those tactics it kind of all goes. For together. me, I can see how as we do continuous professional development, how that ties into student achievement, and I like that link. I mean, to say that that's what it's there for, that part makes sense to me. And it might, I mean, I don't know if it joins aligning and delivering curriculum or it's those two merge somehow. Did you guys talk about that? There's already one tactic, which is provide PD. Yeah. I, I think the point is though, that that one tactic didn't speak to the signal. No, okay. I, no, no, I, I understand that. And I like, I like these other tactics, but I, okay. I think that, that justifies tactic. why it would be. Why, what, this, there it goes. That the tactics no, would be in there. No, um, either way. But I, I, think but I, I agree that goal three makes sense. I like it in goal three. Um, Either as, Again, or as a block, block, there, block or, there, or you know, if we can alter the wording with a line and deliver and deliver curriculum. I like it in the whole three. Yeah, you know, as um, part and parcel either with as a block there enhancing or, you know, quality, quality professional development. development. If we can alter the wording with a line make sure that it's emphasized in significance. That, you know, yeah, we're, we're, with the whole point of goal three, we're trying to you know, show how we're going to get our, our kids to achieve. Sure that it's emphasized um, significance and that, you know, PD is definitely with the whole point of get us there. Trying to a big part of the way. Get our, our kids to achieve, um, um, and PD is definitely going to get us there. A big part of the way. Okay, so that's a pretty that's a pretty simple edit in many ways. Just move those over. Um, any thoughts about the goal language? Reach and achieve. I really liked it. Cool. You want to keep reach and achieve? I know. I'm actually saying to keep both. No way. I know. Okay. So, so you know the background of getting there. Um, 
so after the last meeting, I think Molly started it by saying, you know, let's get some teacher input on this. So we uh, created, she created a, a uh, not a word wall, but a uh, word, cloud. word cloud. And um, so we got teacher input uh, from that. And, and those two words resonated th through the word cloud. So that's how, why they're more prominently in both in that goal. I, I, I just unmuted. Um, I, um, I like it. I, I like it. Reach and achieve I, academic, I um, social and emotional potential. I, it, um, I still don't need that know that it, that it um, that it hits that like, that I, that um, wow statement that I, that, that I felt this Goal that I felt this deserve, goal like like sort of deserved because I feel like it's a lofty like goal with a, with a lot in it strategies. when I like, when I look at the objectives and the strategies you know, like, like this is tears, our teachers, in this, uh, you know goal. like blood like, sweat why, and tears um, in this uh, goal yeah, like this is field. why um, educators so I, I we get I into the field player. and this is, that we have to, um, not, so, so I, ha I was thinking when we left, let when I, had, I was it. playing um, around and, I, and not I, I that like we have to, not, so I'm just gonna, I thought of it, so, and so I'm just gonna let everyone know so that they can hear it. Um, although I, I, I like uh, the, the collaboration I that, with teachers on um, the goal. I don't as know. Like, I, I like also, the, but um, so I had come up with uh, strive for academic to, excellence while supporting um, the, the social history, emotional needs of our students. Um, because I, I thought that. It's a lot um, I don't know. Like I, I know, liked the, the that terminology of academic the work on the objective I think strategies that speaks to of this um, the history of the learning here. And I think that that, um, like I already said, I think that, that it's a lofty, um, you know, it's a lofty, I think that with the the work on the objectives the strategies and the tactics of this goal we are also working towards goal one of grow enrollment and goal two of nurture and invest a community i almost wonder is it is this and achieve the reach that sort of hits me oddly i'm unmute myself i'm wondering if it's reaching to achieve which means that you're the the goal is higher than we are already i guess it's like I feel, I'm with you in that I wanted to have a little more oomph. Um, and I'm wondering if so it's breaking apart academic, social, and emotional. Like, can you guys speak to, so Jen's version, sort of the punt, the, the packing the punch is on academic. And it's just like, but not forgetting, like in the context of, and and you guys came back with a more inclusive, all it feels like they're all equal so you want to speak to that i mean i, I no please go um, i don't know I, I i i'm ambivalent about a bit uh, in, in the sense that i think that the whole child of all ages has to have excellence in all three to really graduate you know when we think about and it's probably an activity we should do is a, a profile of a graduate we want well-rounded young people who go out into our community and beyond who have strengths in all areas but over the course of the years their strengths may vary because of where they are right i mean some kids are going, you know, have a banner year academically, but may have missteps socially uh, and therefore have missteps emotionally. And so the following year, we may work on those more, you know, with more emphasis with strategies with teachers and so forth with that particular student. But in the end, we want there to be a balance of what, whatever their potential was, it was reached. And that's the inclusive part, right? Because academic excellence is going to look different 
for different kids based on who they are. And, and so um, we just want them to have made the, the necessary progress each year to really have grown and reach toward their the definition of academic excellence and social excellence, if you will. I, I like the word excellence. I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I, I get the punch part about that because um, it's like academic what or social what. Um, so I, I get that. Um, but I, I, I'm sort of struggling with trying to emphasize one over the other two because I think they're all so vitally important. And each child is so different that their strength when they graduate here may be emotional intelligence. And so, and if we help to develop that and contribute that along with their family, you know, that child made it, you know, to me, they, they reached a potential that, that, you know, we contributed toward. Um, and the current research, particularly coming out of COVID is that this, we have students who have more deficits in social and emotional skills and understanding than ever before. Um, so particularly thinking about this is our post COVID dip. Um, I, I think, you know, in, outside of the research for the last 15 years, talking about this importance, I think uh, the, the, it has to be at least, equal, you know, in, in that sense, from a research standpoint. Um, I'm wondering about a kind of hybrid. You said reaching to achieve and then reach to achieve. I just okay. like the then, sense of it's achievement is higher than we are today. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if we just swap potential with excellence. I was, I was also, also wondering that too. That too. Using excellence, using excellence there or saying highest, say potential. highest potential. Because, because that, that, I don't know, I don't know. as you were as saying, you were each kid saying, is different. Each kid mm -hmm. is different. Their highest potential their, is their highest potential really, is what, we're aiming really for. what we're aiming for. Right. Mm -hmm. So reach, reach to achieve reach academic to excellence. Achieve. Academic excellence. Reaching is the action and then getting there. I don't know, reach. Reach for and achieve. It just it's so reach for excellence. Reaching is the academic excellence. Reach so reach for excellence. Excellence in academic, in academic, social, and emotional. That actually, I like that. Just reach for academic, social, and emotional excellence. Were you on there? Sorry. No, I just, I changed. Now I have something to say. I said there's too many words. <laughs> <laughs> I, started I read this in the packet and I was like, that's really nice. And now I'm like, oh, it too is many a lot words. words. I you can, you can completely disagree with me, but we could take academic, social, emotional, and really embed that in the objectives, like full it academic, full it social, full it emotional, and kind of like take it out of the overall goal. Just to make it a little bit so, so anyway. Make, so make the goal it reach it. and achieve. For potential or reach for, oh, oh. for excellence. Oh, reach. reach for excellence or reach for reach for excellence or reach for excellence. Reach for excellence. Reach for reach and achieve. Yeah. Achieve our highest potential. Whatever <laughs> however it comes there. Hmm? Yeah. I don't like highest potential. That I that feel that's limiting i i do, do. i know i went and, and i i the, and that was kind of the 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 vibe i got when the, the I, I got when, when i read reach and achieve academic social and emotional potential 
it felt to me like the bar was like the bar was set kind of low is is what it felt like and i do feel like as a, as a behavior analyst within the public schools i also view part of that social and emotional learning as tied to students being supported appropriately academically and i think that 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 there isn't really that. and i think that as you mentioned covid i i almost feel like that's more important now than it used to be because kids that you know come to school and although they're you know they're there certainly are your students that are going to come to school after COVID and for reasons that are not tied to academic reasons are going to be in a place where they need a lot of social but what I see a lot of but what I see a lot of in the public schools are kids that um, you know are kids that are all in one grade that are coming back at very different levels for very different reasons and that is the beginning of a really big social and emotional struggle to so me, to me and excellence and it could be a student has, who has significant has, has anyways, significant, who was anyways going to have significant academic challenges was or a kid who just was a little bit under service or didn't get what they needed or academically or during COVID or your I feel that our job as a school and as teachers and a school team is, is to really start with making sure that academically we're providing what they need because I think that then it's going to be it becomes easier too to tease out what we're what are these kind of additional outside of school social emotional mental health um, resources that we need to give these families how do we service them within the school and and so that the goal when, when I was thinking of it that that was just my thought process so if we said reach for excellence and then we had bulleted tactics that separated out academic social emotional social under the second goal, which is nurture under and invest the in community, goal, which is in the objective, objective community block, in the objective, there is a objective small heading. So we can have a small heading. There for is the a small heading of um, so we can have academic, a small social, emotional for the achievement sphere of yeah. um, and then academic, or social, emotional measured by or obtained by, and and then. Or these bullets that are already there. In, right. in some ways, I actually like that better because the objective, while the goal is really kind of like the big picture, the objective really includes measurement. And then we're sure that we are, in fact, measuring in each area rather than just like saying we're going to address every area. We actually write down how we will measure each one. So I think it's nice. Right now, the strategies don't particularly align So the academic strategy, like right now, everything pretty much funnels to the academic piece. So everything that's written in strategies is there. Um, we had a few pieces about identifying students with needs and programs for diverse needs that we felt like needed to come into this that, that didn't fit any longer with some of the other goals. And so we were looking like, okay, let's not lose them. So there, there's a little note at the bottom of that page. So really don't lose them, mm -hmm. but they don't fit in here yet. So if we do that, then there's sort of the need for kind of two more strategies in this piece, one speaking to social and one speaking to emotional or they some hybrid of them. So in the the emotional piece could we say something specific to emotional intelligence because as molly alluded to earlier there's a lot of research our students cannot label emotions they can't identify emotions and they definitely are still working on regulating them that all goes under that umbrella of emotional intelligence which I have a plan to address, um, starting with the staff and then with students, and there's a curriculum to go with it. So I just couldn't give my staff one more thing to do while they were reading the manual and flying the plane with math this year. But that's definitely something that they're they're open to, they're, they're interested in, and definitely could be doable within 
the next three years with this plan. So I think emotional intelligence would be definitely a, a good strategy, if not objective. And thank you for adding that at the end of that because that's like emotional difficulty. It's got to be emotional intelligence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is there a social, social component for that? A social intelligence? Yeah. Or, there isn't that might be more of like that might be more social, social, social pragmatics sure because that would be un, um, un, kind of like more about that whole social the, the other along. component and it actually was something that we were just unpacking with the smith team going through the executive functioning piece is we're we're seeing a lot and this is across many districts and we're having this conversation um of deficits under what's described as executive functioning skills. Um, and there's no clear diagnosis of that. It's not, it's not one of the criteria um, categories that we have, um, but it obviously is impacts um, related to different uh, diagnoses, but uh, particularly post COVID coming out, the, the executive functioning skills of the kids after having a year, two years, three years, um, not having that demand level um, that they have to have in a school setting between social and sensory and organization and uh, you know sorting out information as it comes to them. Um, that in order to access school, we need to continue to build these skills. And what I hadn't really unpacked until we were working on it with the Smith team last week, is we've traditionally thought of executive function as only those organizational skills. And it's not, it's so much more that fall under social and emotional. And kids can't even start looking at academics. They can't understand the directions given to them. They can't regulate their bodies unless they have those skills. So it is, I hear you, there's chicken, chicken or the egg kind of thing. Um, but I, I think uh, based on what we're seeing with our current kids all all grade levels that that that's a component of it's not like the classic social and emotional skills in terms of like regulation or behavior where you know those things we're very supportive of we have structures in place for um it's a matter of these like student soft skills and self-regulation related to task completion and understanding um and and all of that falls under the social and emotional need umbrellas but so, so if there is if there is a, a bucket for academics and the pdp sort of falls into that column as its own strategy but a column and then there's an emotional intelligence strategy and it gets a column what is the title of is it social pragmatic build social pragmatics what's the title of the bucket how did like is the do those break okay. apart? Yeah. I'm good. Sorry, I'm muted. Pragmatics is more the language, language piece. Right. Social thinking is more understanding of your thoughts and other thoughts. thoughts. Um, social, social skills, skills kind of covers right. Right. a lot of, of it. Because you have to incorporate not only your ability to communicate with others, but understand your own feelings in that and your own pers perspective. And there's the empathy piece of being able to understand how someone else might be feeling and then regulation. So I think the skills piece would be mm -hmm. so social skills. Mm -hmm. It incorporates too many things. So many that one, so that would be three columns, academics, emotional intelligence, social skills. Yes. And so those would be the three bullets of what we're achieving or reaching for excellence. Mm -hmm. Let's stop and feel, does that have the oomph we're, we're looking for? What if we decide upon for the goal? Do we decide? I don't think we have a clear decision. I thought, so, I thought the goal was reach for excellence. And then the objective was going to, and then the we need to pull it out the three, to, the three pieces, the academic, the social, out, and the emotional. The three, the three pieces, the and academic, there, the, the strategies social, the would support and then from there, the strategies would support So in objectives. doing, we may have an extra, it might be more than three objectives in that there, because there's more measurement there. So there might be a PD measurement in that 
that's a little that's a piece because it would be a strategy specific measurement um that would and that way it wouldn't just be one academic piece um i'm i'm curious if the writing rubric starts to feel like it falls underneath it does yeah i can almost see a lot of what's in the pink and the blue kind of push over to the academic piece yeah in, I, in a meaningful way so if the writing rubric could that become a tactic in the green mm -hmm. is that and i almost think we should broaden it given the work that the high school middle school and high school is doing that it should be content rubrics would that, would that make sense and that we, we could start looking at it across different like content that levels. The um, yellow item of measurement for inclusive skills. Um, we already are going to have that all underlined strategy. Um, is that something different? What was so this? We need a little like as we're lining this up, we need to come back and say, okay, how are we measuring for the academic? six excellence like what is the measurement of academic excellence what is the measurement and and right now we have um district level performance is a piece of that um we may want some other district like right now we have a placeholder for math scores does it need to be math scores does it need to be math and the and like we need to decide what we're going to measure because what we measure gets done so um I think that's it's yellow because it's on it's not finished <laughs> it's yellow because it needs to find and then my question is what is how are we going to measure emotional intelligence work and growth and achievement and social skills and social skills that's my next one I, the measurement is the same with with in some ways with those in place we would expect our academics to all be higher. If they're available for learning, we're supposed to it. Do we also have like the spiffy survey? We, we, Stuff we like that. We have like, that... like 20 things. We, we yeah. wrote it as no, 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 but I'm saying like, is that the kind of thing that we yeah, have we, the spiffy measurement or no? I don't we, know. That would be kind of under both spiffy the vocal. Yeah. We, we were talking about, um, we identified that there's certain grade levels we don't have something for, so we're trying to or look at um, their screeners related to it. So. Right, because currently there was something, an opt-out letter went home to families for grades three through six at the elementary level on the CELIS because we were working with the state. We're one of the districts that is trying to incorporate more information, more data around students' feelings about how they're at the school. And it's all based on CASEL, so. Is, is that, is that what you you were about, talking uh, about at our, last um, meeting, at our last meeting that there's good not standardized good for, standardized measures. It only has for, two, only fourth and fifth. We don't have any other data other than fourth grade and fifth grade. So this at least gives us four grade level spans of data versus just the two. Yeah. I, I would also, I would also want to add that, add that, that, that I do think that, in kind of looking at um, the, um, I do the think in kind of looking at, at, at the the writing rubrics and how it's tied to SRSD. I think that it serves the district well if we do look at the work or specific focus for each content areas as we're getting into this new math curriculum. We don't want to lose the work or lose focus on the writing that's not that old in district yet. And then we also, you know, and there has been a lot of work. And so we, I think you need to, um, I, I think that we, although again, like it, it makes it a big goal, I think that we need so to. So I, I hear you and I understand that if all these other pieces are working then the test scores go up. If we, my concern is if we aren't measuring for those separately, that if the test scores don't move where we think, like we don't have a way to diagnose which, which lever we need to turn or push, a little mixed analogy there. But um, mm -hmm. so I, I think it would serve us well to have 
something in the objectives that is more specific and and that sounds challenging yeah because i'm wondering if we still could base it on some of the vocal scores even though it's not going to be given in every grade i mean at least at this point the c-list is screaming three times a year twice twice a year one huh? twice so we had, we're doing it in the fall and then again in the spring and that does not include mcas mcas is the vocal that's after um fourth and fifth have completed their last assessment this is going to be done actually within the next few weeks the window opens the 26th of october and goes until november 10th so we're going to survey students in grades three through six and then we do it again in the spring and the state is the one who sets that window it's not us so again that's going to give us a lot of interesting data but more importantly the reason we wanted to incorporate the set of the third graders is because next year they will be fourth graders taking it so hopefully if we can see that third grade data, we should be able to see some increases or decreases depending upon what the question is asking about their comfort level in school, depending upon if it's an always, seldom, never, some, I mean, however the, the wording is, that's pretty much how the vocal language is on the survey. So we could conceivably be able to look at some of that data that way. We can talk more about what's available through Spiffy too and see if there's anything that measures. Again, I don't think it needs to be every grade, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we need to have a, a you know, laser focus on it in each grade mm -hmm. in terms of the skills being developed. Yeah. Just uh, out of curiosity, post-COVID, are you seeing a difference with it impacting more uh, younger grades? It's a combination of both, and I think it depends on the grade of what that, that looks like. Um, older grades or a combination of both? At this point, it comes across as being very immature behavior, and that immature behavior is globally. It's, it's in the social pragmatic piece of getting along with others, other explaining how you feel, the um, impulsivity of some students to just, you know, they've been home, they want what they want, they just think it's okay to just get up and get, go get it. So it's, it's a kind of a combination. I think, and it, I think it varies all the way from preschool to, yeah. to 12th grade. Each is different um, for, you know, lows and highs. So, you know, we have some preschool kindergartners that hadn't been near other kids and are running towards them and loving, loving it all up and others having a hard time to transition. Um, and we have, um, you know, older kids who are you know, maybe taking some risks they haven't been able to, and others who are scared to take risks. Um, so I think it, it varies, but all of those things mean we have kids away from the, the what used to be the normed curve um, in, a, in a bigger way. So we want to bring them back, whether it's, um, you know, we need to encourage some kids to come out of their shell. As they, they may behave just great and, and do their work, but then can't take, go to that spot where they are collaborating with their peers, um, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think practically speaking, that's that's the, the biggest thing I've seen and in, in, in heard teachers talking about at the high school level is, um, you know, that's one of the reasons we, we have collaborative learning as a, as a focus point is, um, you know, there, there are kids that are struggling to work together. Um, you know, things things as simple as, you know, this is how you, how you talk among a group to, to get to a certain goal. Um, and there are some that are doing it really well. A lot of them are doing it really well. Um, but, but I think we see more of a um, more, more of a, a wide range than we have in the past in terms of, of, of ability. Um, in, um, you know, along with that comes, comes a, a, a quick quickness to, to, to get frustrated um, and, and to kind of not, not push through uh, when they can just kind of look something up on, a, you know, on the internet and try to get an answer that way. Um, so really, you know, that, that, that was a, a driving force be behind that, that focus as well. So that it's, I guess that's part of it's all wrapped up together. Social stamina, emotional stamina, academic stamina. <laughs> it fluctuates. <laughs> That's 
Okay. So those pieces on the bottom, you were, the bottom that you were you didn't want to lose them. You didn't want wanted to, to look in. They would probably fit in them. They would. They would with the yeah. yeah. So that's good that we have a place for them. Yeah. 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 For me, the seal would have much better. Like, like, it's them. inclusive yeah. and holistic, and it's, it's got a natural fix that it can deliver something. Right. That's good. Um, I would, is there any more we want to talk about? Three. Thank you. It's easy to watch everybody else's, right? <laughs> um, before, I, I would like to take a look at page five. So this is um, part of nurture and invested community. So as we shifted things around, the, the one piece is we sat down to look at sort of some of the tactical stuff that we felt like, oh, this is not as clearly identified as it we think it should be. We added this in <laughs> offline <coughs> so that um, finding some, uh, uh, just making a really clear strategy about supporting staff as part of a key, <laughs> a huge key component to that community. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we have been talking about for a long time is finding a way to partner with staff and town to engage in um, better insurance options. We don't control it, but we can help bring everybody to the table um, as best possible. And I felt like this might be an opportunity to like make sure we're keeping track of that and that we're, we're owning and moving that forward. Um, Budgeting for PD is sort of a piece of that, Jen. So some of that stuff moved into that. But I, I feel like there's more that belongs here that sort of came up in conversation, but it wasn't necessarily a specific piece that was written on another part of the plan. And so I'm just going to say offline, if we have some things we'd like to, or tonight, have some pieces that we want to add into that staff support. Um, the I think that might be worthwhile. And I'm just wondering though, if that, if support staff is, um, fits in more with goal to nurture an invested community under. It is. It is. It is. It is. That's where it is. That's where it is. We added, added, added it because, because it is in the objective it said to maintain oh because that that okay i'm sorry well that's a great place for it. <laughs> because it because in the objective it said maintain staff retention we wanted to have something that addressed staff and and in a way of supporting them so we're I just think we're under tactic in that particular category because obviously there's some great things we could do. So maybe we can um, take a look at some other ideas that come in there. And then we've already checked this other piece, Jen, is moving to goal three. We know where that's going. Um, under tactic. That's new, new language, new language for tonight. Um, so there's there is still some homework if anyone would like to anyone would like to volunteer to do some homework uh, before this comes back in a month um, in particular we need a little work around objective setting i will do it with someone i would really love to have a partner Yeah, that would be good. The other piece, administration, I strongly encourage you to fill out and look at um, and bring back your changes requested on implementation dates for tactics. So um, we really didn't try to stuff it all into the next two months. We thought about it, but we didn't think that would work very well. Um, but there are pieces that we did feel like, ooh, there are a few things on here. We're like, October, we need to like, we need to check that box because a lot of stuff started to fall after it. Um, 
And as we looked at backing up things from budget season, <laughs> you'll see sort of March is a pivotal period because we would need to have things in our budget that got approved to go into the rest of the town budget stuff. So some of these decisions and, and thinking need to happen by then in order to keep moving into the budget process. So that's how we got to some of the dates we reached. Okay, so any further discussion on the dip? Are you dipped out? And so last on our uh, docket tonight is a report out and a vote on the superintendent goals. As you guys know, this is one of our key um, responsibilities as school committee members yeah, is working with our superintendent. And he has delivered some goals. So I turn that over, Michael, if you'd like to speak to that. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you have to hear me There we go. Uh, so you, you had them to read, I think they're self-explanatory. I think they're all related to different topics we've discussed uh, over last year and um, this fall. Um, the first one has to do with uh, looking at race, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is uh, something that I is near and dear to me. And I think we've already seen evidence that there's learning to be had. Um, then looking at finance, um, I think that this is going to be uh, a, a very challenging year. Uh, I, I don't think that it's um, um, going to come to anybody's surprise that as we look at fewer ARPA funds, uh, we're going to be challenged uh, to align what's really a robust district improvement plan with a budget that affords it. Uh, so we're going to have to be very creative in how we budget. Um, so I've put that forth. Um, I know that I've got it in terms of the timeline. It really has to be not passed at town meeting, but um, probably s simply leaving it at uh, endorsed by the uh, town and select board and the finance committee because we're thinking the timeline should be do the evaluation in April. So everybody who's current on the board. Uh, should there be any changes in May, isn't uh, faced with with sort of a what <laughs> kind of uh, situation uh, with an evaluation of the superintendent for a year. Um, then looking at communication, we've talked a lot about that over the last year uh, and this fall in terms of everything from marketing to communication, what's happening uh, simply and going on, how to talk about uh, events that uh, we need to talk about with the community, difficult conversations. Um, I know that Christy has had a lot of experience in this field. This is her field. So I, I, I envious of learning more from her um, and um, you know, really looking at this. I drafted a, a, a plan. I think I just, I need to look at how to refine that and make it connected to the district improvement plan. Um, and I just to kind of maybe back up a little bit. As I've learned about this process and just in general in the SMART goals, the, the real idea behind them is not just to do something, like just have a product. It's, it's actually to learn something and something you're gonna, you know, that's gonna keep with you. So, uh, you know, as I try to write the goal, it's about what I'm gonna learn. Although the end product is gonna be the evidence um, and hopefully I'm showing you what I've learned and that's what I'm being evaluated on. Um, and then something really near and dear to me, it's just something I've, I've wanted to create, um, not only here uh, for a lot of reasons, but to look at a dashboard, to learn more about the data that we have. Um, have field, even as small as it is, it's been very hard to kind of put my hands on data, everything from financial data to student data. It's just not in one place. Um, and we really need it to be one place so that we can be you know, that our teachers can look at it, our principals can look at it, I can look at it, you can look at it, our community can look at it, community can look at it, and um, we can have um, meaningful, for the most part, real-time data that people can say, oh, that's where you got that number, that's why you're talking about that number, 
as opposed to somebody, you know, groups of people coming in with three different conversations about three different pieces of information because they got their numbers from three different places. So, so those are my goals. Okay. Committee, do you have questions or thoughts, requests, Becca? Um, can you just clarify, I, I liked how you formatted sort of like a product um, at the end of each goal, but I don't see one for number four. I don't know if that got cut off I think. when we put it into the agenda, but I don't have it electronically either. I was wondering. Oh, yeah. it, it did get cut off. It's, it's the student, it's the data, the dashboard. data dashboard. Data dashboard. And that would be accessible. That would be for be online for is, your is use, but idea. for everybody, right. for district use. Thank you. I like the idea of a data dashboard just getting information that you can pull. These are the results schools as presented. Based on, yeah. um, all in favor? Uh, Aye. So moved. Uh, Passed. Okay, so we will next um, have a report out on those goals. Michael will report back in January since we formalized this in October, and then the formal evaluation in April. And um, the next time we see these, they'll be back into the nice little DESI format. We'll just prepare ourselves. So, okay. Um, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. And I hear many seconds. Yes. So, <laughs> so thanks, guys. Who did get the second? I think Becca has second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you much.